Thank you very much, Shiva. It's very nice to be here. You have heard here a series of brilliant lectures, and it's what I will be talking about today is very, very basic, very elementary, just to uh, set up the scene, set up the language, which is used in nanomechanics. And nonmechanical systems have uh, several faces to them. Uh, much of the interest in nano and micromechanics comes from applications. Uh, everybody has a cell phone uh, in his or her pocket, and uh, there is a lot of micromechanical systems. Somebody told me about 20 micromechanical systems in each cell phone. Uh, nanomechanics probably uh, will allow us to, and is already actually, uh, allowing us making measurements of mass with very high sensitivity force, with extremely high sensitivity, um, magnetic moments, uh, sub, uh, sub uh, one spin resolution. One. So it's very good for different applications. There are two basic physics aspects of nanomechanics. One is the dynamics itself. Nanomechanical systems are physical systems with complicated properties, interesting and rich. And also, these are unique systems that allow us to ask questions about the behavior of physical systems away from thermal equilibrium. There is much interest in this area, partly coming from biology and partly primarily coming, this, this is my interest in the first place, coming from physics. What happens if the system is driven away from equilibrium? There is no thermodynamics. There, are no, there is no Boltzmann distribution. What can we say about the dynamics of a system? What can we say in particular about fluctuations in systems away from equilibrium, in classical systems, in quantum systems? And to answer this question properly, we need to have systems which are well characterized so that we know what is being measured and what is being calculated and can compare this in a meaningful way. So uh, my plan for the lectures, and the lecture notes are actually on the internet, and I'm not sure I will be following them literally, but my plan today is to set the scene. And in some sense, what I will be talking about has been referred to implicitly or explicitly. I just want to show you how a calculation is done when you are talking about nonlinear dynamics in particular. What is the language for describing nonlinear dynamical systems, nonlinear vibrational systems, what the rotation wave approximation is about, what is the difference between quantum and classical description. And then uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, we will be talking about Floquet dynamics and non-mechanical systems and other mesoscopic vibrational systems, that is, systems which are sufficiently small so that quantum and classical fluctuations are significant and at the same time sufficiently large so that you can measure a single system. You don't have to do an ensemble measurement. So we are here in the room, we have pressure. Pressure is an ensemble characteristic of the air in this room. With a non-mechanical system, you can measure a single system, which is at the same time sufficiently big that you can make a single particle measurement. Uh, so besides nanomechanical systems, there are modes in the cavities that we have heard about today and uh, I think yesterday. Uh, there are um, Josephson junctions, and these are probably the three major types of mesoscopic vibrational systems that are being explored today. Much of what I will be talking about refers to all of them. All of them allow us to uh, peek at what is happening at the microscopic level with systems away from thermal equilibrium. So the first thing about non-equilibrium system is how to drive the system away from thermal equilibrium. And the easiest way to drive the system is to apply force. So we have an oscillator 
which is described by this simple dynamical equation. Let's start with the linear oscillator. The mass is set equal to 1 and will always be 1 in what I will be talking about. This is the friction coefficient, and this friction force is linear friction force. That is, the friction force is proportional to the velocity. Omega naught is the frequency, and it is equal to, to the force. So uh, the answer to this equation is given in terms of the susceptibility. That is, I solve to find the susceptibility. I say, OK, let's remove uh, the real part here. And I will then restore it. And then I know that the solution of this equation will be Q stationary solution. Q is equal to chi of omega f f e to the minus i omega f t. It's a linear equation, and so this is a linear, a linear solution. Periodic vibrations at the frequency of the drive. And chi of omega, just plug it in, is uh, what? Is minus omega squared plus omega naught squared uh, minus 2i gamma omega to the power minus 1. Uh, I guess it is correct. <clears throat> and if I instead put in here a real part, f e to the minus i omega f t, then my vibration become a real part, chi of omega f f e to the minus i omega f t. And I know that these are vibrations at uh, the frequency of the drive omega f. So I can write them as a cosine omega f t plus some phase. They're shifted in phase with respect to the driving force. And <clears throat> the amplitude, the amplitude is just the absolute value of this susceptibility. It's f times absolute value chi of omega f. And so uh, this is f divided by omega f squared minus omega naught squared squared plus 4 gamma squared omega f squared. Yeah, probably this correct. Please interrupt me if I make mistakes and if you if I'm going too fast or if I'm going too slow. Probably I will not go too slowly. And I apologize again. This will be very, very introductory, very, very simple. Uh, yeah, I, it's to the one half. All right. Let me let me do it like that. Uh, uh, wait a second. All right. Let me let me let me do it like that. I want to have epsilon squared. I want to have f squared. Thank you, Asla. <clears throat> so this is what I want to have. And I will uh, reproduce this expression here as f squared over omega f squared minus omega naught squared. Let me, let me simplify it a little bit before I do it, because what I will be talking about uh, for much of this uh, class today and on uh, and tomorrow is the situation where the driving is almost resonant. So resonant driving omega f minus omega naught is much less than omega naught. That is the frequency of the drive 
is close to the eigenfrequency of the oscillator. And I will use delta omega as omega f minus omega naught. And then I can rewrite uh, this equation in the following form, that a squared is equal to f squared. So look what I do. I write this as omega f minus omega naught squared times omega f plus omega naught squared. Now, this difference is small. I keep it. This is almost twice omega f squared. And therefore, I will write it. I have then this 4 omega f squared here and 4 omega f squared here. So I will write it as f squared over 4 omega f squared. And here I have what is left, delta omega squared plus gamma squared. OK? Or I will, to, to, to make life simpler for this, for, for now, I will write it as omega f minus omega naught squared plus gamma squared. <clears throat> Now, this is almost Lorentzian. Sometimes you heard today that this was called Lorentzian, complex Lorentzian. Uh, if you want to find the, the absorption coefficient, uh, the absorption coefficient is the power absorbed by the field QF cosine omega FT. And averaging means that I average the work of the force, this is the work done by the force. I average it over the period. And this is proportional to f squared omega f imaginary part of chi of omega f. Again, if you use this expression, you have to, to find q dot you have to differentiate this over time. You will have omega f and i. Now you take the real part. Because it is i, it becomes the imaginary part of chi. So absorption coefficient is expressed in terms of the imaginary part of the susceptibility. And this imaginary part of the susceptibility, as you see, this is the formula that is familiar. Uh, which one? Let's try this one. <laughs> that imaginary part of susceptibility is gamma over gamma squared plus omega f minus omega naught squared when omega f is close to omega naught. And this is this Lorentzian function that you're all familiar with. So this is often uh, how you do measurements. You apply a drive to a non-mechanical system, and you measure its response. And you change the frequency of the drive, and you again measure the response. And you find that this response is described by this Lorentzian function, which tells you what the frequency of the non-mechanical system is and what is its decay rate. And this is at the very naive level where we don't talk about decoherence and other effects, which can be, of course, incorporated. So this was, uh, this was a linear system. What will happen if the system is nonlinear? Again, this is something we can play with. I will not use this. And the bad thing about nonlinear systems is that 
you don't have a luxury of using complex variables, you better use real forces and be careful with what you are doing. You can use complex language, of course, but be careful. So what is the simplest kind of nonlinearity that you can encounter? So you have a nonlinear system, and you bend it. For example, this is a nanotube. You bend it. And a linear assumption is that the restoring force is proportional to the amplitude of your vibration. This is the restoring force from the, uh, from, from the tension industry. Now, uh, we are here in Trieste. It's on one side of the peninsula. If we go straight west to the opposite side of the peninsula, we will find ourselves in Pisa and uh, about, uh, what, uh, Oh, 350 years ago, Galileo was there and he was watching the pendulum. And he found that the pendulum performs uh, periodic vibrations. And this is how clocks became practical. This is the period, period of vibrations of a pendulum that uh, Galileo found. Uh, what uh, you were told in your first physics class uh, was that these vibrations are independent of their amplitude, which of course is not true. They are dependent on the amplitude. Galileo just was watching chandelier in this cathedral, and the vibration amplitude was very small. Uh, small compared to the length of the chandelier. Uh, the fact that, the vibra that vibration amplitude depends on uh, the vibration frequency depends on amplitude. It's more or less obvious if you think of a pendulum, right? And if you make the whole turn up, then the pendulum just freezes over there. So clearly the vibration period at this point is infinite. So here it is one frequency. Here this frequency is zero. So the frequency clearly depends on the vibration amplitude. Uh, and uh, it took about 250 years uh, between uh, Galileo's invention and uh, Jacobi uh, found a way to describe the properties of the vibrations of the pendulum uh, and introduced uh, Jacobi functions. Uh, these elliptic integrals and elliptic functions which are called Jacobi elliptic functions, describe vibrations of the pendulum. So these vibrations of a pendulum are not sinusoidal in time. They depend on time in terms of Jacobi elliptic functions. What uh, a simple, very simple model that captures the nonlinearity is the model which keeps the first non-trivial nonlinear term in the restoring force. And if I look at the spring, uh, excuse me, if I look at the string, I understand that if I move the string straight, if I move, move it up and down, up and down, the string doesn't have any difference if this bending is the same. So the nonlinear term in the displacement of the string must be proportional to q cube, where q is the displacement. Because if it were proportional to q squared, then the restoring force would have the same component for up and down displacement. But it may not have the same component for up and down displacement. It has to change sign, because these displacements are the same. And therefore, this is the first nonlinear term in the restoring force for a system with symmetry. And in this case, it is inversion symmetry. And so what I do, I add here a 
nonlinear term. Now, if I forget about this part, uh, this model is called Duffing. Duffing oscillator. <clears throat> Uh, this nonlinearity is called the ducking nonlinearity, or sometimes it is called from optics, it is care nonlinearity. And it, uh, this term is used more and more frequently in, uh, in nanomechanics, although the term comes from optics. And in optics, if you have a nonlinear optical medium, the polarization of the medium is. Well, we are used to having kappa E, but then there is another term, and this is called kernel linearity in optics, where E is the electric field and P is the polarization. So as you see, this term has the same structure as this term, and therefore uh, the definite linearity is very frequently called kernel linearity. <coughs> Uh, now, let's talk about uh, this role of the dating or care nonlinearity. And to begin with, I consider an oscillator without friction force. So just a few oscillator. This is a motion of a particle in a potential well. This is, by the way, just the simplest term that you have if you expand the restoring force on a pendulum. If you look at the pendulum, as I said, the frequency depends on amplitude. The restoring force is not proportional to the amplitude. OK, well, let's keep the lowest order term in, the, in this dependence of the restoring force on the amplitude. This is the lowest order term. And I can also think about this system as a particle oscillating in a potential well. But this potential is non-parabolic. So the energy of the system is conserved if there is no friction force. And it is 1 half p squared plus 1 half omega naught squared q squared plus 1 quarter gamma q to the fourth. And the equations of motion are Hamiltonian equation, q dot is equal to p. If, and if I use here, now this e and this e are from different alphabets. This is the electric field, this is energy. So let me remove one of the alphabets <coughs> to avoid confusion. If I call this Hamiltonian, Then the Hamiltonian equation of motion, uh, Q dot, is <coughs> dH dP, and P dot is minus dH dQ. So Q dot is P, P dot is dH dQ is minus omega naught squared Q minus gamma Q cube. If I plug this into the, if I just differentiate it again, P dot is Q double dot, I reproduce this equation. So these are Hamiltonian equations of motion. But I know uh, that this motion of the particle are just vibrations. So I understand that the vibration period depends on amplitude. How to find it? Well, very simple. Uh, vibration period is integral dq over q dot calculated along the orbit. So I start with this point q. I move 
to this point where I stop and then I come back. I calculate how much time it has taken me to make this vibration. I find the vibration here. And now I will plug this in is integral dq over square root of so I want to express q dot from this equation I understand that this is q dot squared right p is q dot so I can express this q dot in terms of energy and this part so let's see if I get it right to e minus omega naught squared q squared minus one half gamma q to the fourth. And I understand that this vibration back and forth is the period is just twice the vibration one way. So I will find, put here factor of two integral from q minimum to q maximum, where q minimum is this position and q maximum is this position. Well, so can I calculate it? Well, Jacobi did it. Uh, uh, can I use, now here's my question for you. So suppose, as I said, my gamma is small, my nonlinearity is small, my nonlinearity parameter is gamma. Can I expand this function in gamma? Did anybody try? Just as it stands. The answer is yes, but I have to be smart. <laughs> but I have to do it carefully. I have to do it carefully because I have to be careful about these limits of integration. So first of all, without this term, this integral, you know, this integral is independent of E, right? Because uh, I can, I can write it as a, the vibrations are sinusoidal, so I essentially I will, I will use this sheet. But when I take gamma q to the fourth, I have to take into account that if I do the expansion, I will have a, a singularity here. I have to be more careful. I have to take into account uh, some shift. And yes, the answer is yes, you can do the expansion. You just have to know what you are doing. And if you know what you are doing, then what you will have is uh, 2 pi over omega naught, right? That part I know, because this is the period of the harmonic oscillator, right? Then what I will have 1 minus, OK, what can I possibly, what can I possibly have here? I have to have a correction which will be proportional to gamma. Right? I have to have a correction which will be proportional to E. Then I have to maintain dimension. And to maintain dimension, I think I have to have a mega naught cube. I'm not sure. Uh, no, you want a mega naught to the fourth. Of course. Sorry. <clears throat> And then there is a coefficient here. And this coefficient is equal to uh, 3 quarter. Now, how do you know the sign? Well, if gamma is positive, then the potential becomes steeper as I squeeze it. So the period should go down. The frequency should go up. And so this is, this is what I have. 
So uh, this is my uh, this is my expression, and I can also simplify it slightly. And what I want to do is to express uh, this in terms of the amplitude. And first of all, I will write that omega of e is two pi over t, which is now a function of e, and this is omega naught. And I have to inverse it, and this is plus three quarter gamma e over omega naught to the fourth. Now, this is small correction. What I want to do is to express e in terms of the vibration amplitude. So if I have a harmonic oscillator, then my vibrations q are a cosine omega naught t for a harmonic oscillator. Therefore, the energy is one half q dot squared plus one half omega naught squared q squared, and this is, as you see, one half omega naught squared a squared. So I can also rewrite this in terms of the amplitude one plus. Uh, uh, 3, 8, a squared over omega naught squared. So this is the vibration frequency of the duffing oscillator. This vibration frequency for weak nonlinearity depends on the amplitude, as does the vibration frequency of a pendulum. Again, this is the case of small nonlinearity. Small nonlinearity means not that just gamma is a small parameter. It means that this correction is small compared to 1. That is, the energy is small, or the amplitude is sufficiently small. For strong nonlinearity, for, strong, for large amplitudes, nonlinearity is always strong. OK, so what now happens is the following, uh, the following phenomenon. <clears throat> So we no longer need this, and we no longer need this. I can think of what happens when I have a nonlinear resonator and I drive it by a periodic force. So now I have this equation. Well, I have the vibration frequency as a function of squared amplitude. And I drive here amplitude squared. For sufficiently small amplitude, it's a linear function. It starts at omega naught and goes up. And this is not up to scale, so the nonlinearity is comparatively weak. I'm talking about comparatively small change of frequency. Now I drive my system at some frequency omega f. Intuitively, I can imagine that uh, what can happen is that my system will have small vibration amplitude like this, of forced vibrations excited by the drive. Now, for this drive, for this vibration amplitude, the vibration frequency is largely detuned from the drive frequency, so I'm not having very good resonance. So my amplitude is small. It's, it's a self-consistent regime. But what can also happen is that if for some reason my amplitude is large somewhere here, then the vibration frequency is very close to the drive frequency. So I have a very good resonance. And therefore, my amplitude is large. So I can imagine for that for the same driving field, for the same amplitude of the driving force, 
for the same frequency of the driving force, I can have two self-consistent regimes, one with large amplitude and another with a, one with small amplitude and the other with a large amplitude. Now, formally, it looks in the following, it looks, it is described in the following way, which actually, somewhat surprisingly, is correct, <clears throat> or maybe not surprisingly. So, what I did, I said that my amplitude depends on frequency. So what I have to do in this expression for the amplitude of force vibrations, which we had before, I will just add here 3 eighths gamma A squared over omega naught squared. So now I have an equation for the squared amplitude. So let me rewrite it because I know that sometimes it is confusing. A squared times, um, times omega f minus omega naught plus minus, it's minus of course, minus C8 gamma A squared over omega naught squared squared plus gamma squared is equal to f squared over 4 omega f squared. So I just multiplied a squared by the denominator. And voila, I have a <clears throat> and so the equation for a squared. What is the order of this equation? Okay, let's count. One. Who is who is voting for one? Let's vote. Nobody. Two. Three. <laughs> okay, so who votes for three? Okay, well it's the majority. <laughs> so we agree on three on, 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 on the fact that this is a cubic equation. A squared, a squared squared. This becomes a squared squared times a squared. That's a squared to the, to the power c, right? So a cubic equation, how many roots, real roots, can a cubic equation have? Let's again vote, right? Or, or we should not. So a cubic equation can have, can have three roots or one real root. So now we have a situation where we can have three real roots or one real root. So let's try to draw the dependence of the amplitude of forced vibrations. Now on the amplitude f. So let's see what we have. A squared versus f squared. So let's start with small f squared. What is the dependence of a squared on f squared if f squared is small? If f squared is small, we drive the system weakly. It should be linear, right? Because the amplitude is, uh, is just, it's just a linear oscillator. Amplitude is small. The oscillator is linear, so it starts linearly. But then, of course, it does not continue linearly. It, it goes somehow like that. And then we understand that there is a region where there may be three solutions. So there is a region where there are three solutions. So there is this region and something like that. So what I'm drawing here now, and we will go over this more carefully, how it works out, uh, is that in this region there are three solutions of this cubic equation. And I drew two of them with solid lines and the third with a dashed line. And the full, full curve looks like that. Uh, so what happens here? 
here the amplitude becomes so big that this solution, even though you are far from resonance, it doesn't matter. The amplitude is big anyway. So this solution does not, does not exist. We have only one solution of, of force vibrations. So here I clearly have one solution. Here I also clearly have another solution. Here I have three solutions. And as I explained, I expect self-consistent solutions with small and large amplitude. I may have another one. Now it turns out that this solution is unstable. And we will talk a little bit more about stable and unstable later today. But let me uh, just remind you again talking about the pendulum. I was saying that the pendulum can have this position where it is pointing upward. Uh, well, in principle, it can. In practice, it can't because it is unstable. A little deviation from this position draws it uh, down. And so this solution, it exists. It's a real root of this equation. It's just an unstable root. And uh, this is why I draw it with a dashed line. So in this region, I have three solutions. These points play special role, and we will talk about them. But before we do it, and uh, in line with what I'm going to talk about, about quantum and classical language of the uh, oscillator, let's think of for a second about the quantum feature of the unharmonic oscillator that I'm talking about. So again, the Hamiltonian that I had before here was this. Now, what is the Hamiltonian of the quantum oscillator? Well, quantum Hamiltonian is usually written in terms of the raising and lowering operators, ladder operators, and you are familiar with this. So A dagger A. And Q is a square root of H over 2 omega naught A plus A dagger. And the P is <coughs> respectively minus I omega naught square root of H over 2 omega naught A minus A dagger. Yeah. And Quantum Hamiltonian is something that you clearly have seen. H bar omega naught, A dagger A. I can put here plus one half. I don't want to, but I can. This is for a harmonic oscillator, you know. Now, I say that this nonlinearity is weak. I want to find the correction to the spectrum for weak nonlinearity. So what is the leading order correction for uh, to the energy for weak nonlinearity. How do I calculate it? It's just the diagonal matrix element of the perturbation. So the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian are called Fox states n. A dagger A n is n n. This is your hexene. Do you see what I'm writing here? I don't know. Tell me where I should draw where I should draw the line. Okay, you don't. You don't see it. Okay, well, chairs can be removed. Microphones can be moved in. <laughs> OK, so uh, what I was writing is that these operators have this property that A dagger A times the eigenstate of the harmonic oscillator is N times this eigenstate. This is an eigenstate of A dagger A. This is the Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator. If I, so this is the Hamiltonian of this part. If I want to calculate the correction to the energy from this part, then I say that my En is Nhn 
to the living to the living order. is h bar omega naught n plus one half, right, from this part, plus one quarter gamma n q to the fourth n, the diagonal matrix element. This is the first order correction to the energy. And take my word for it, What? how to calculate it? You have to plug in this expression for a plus a bigger, right? Raise it to the fourth power and uh, just uh, count, count what you have. So this will be h bar omega naught n plus one half plus h bar v n times n plus one half, I think, or n plus one, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it's one half h bar v, and v is three quarter h bar gamma uh, probably over omega naught squared. I think I'm not sure. Yeah. So this is just just a very simple calculation. Plug this in and calculate the diagonal matrix element. So what happens now with these energy levels? What is the quantum analog of the dependence of the vibration frequency on their amplitude or their energy? It means quantum mechanically that the energy levels of the oscillator become non-equidistant. So for a harmonic oscillator, you have energy levels separated by h bar omega naught, h bar omega naught, h bar omega naught. It's just linear in n. When you have n squared, there will be plus v plus, uh, so how to calculate it? If n is 0 and this n is 1. So the difference is n1, 1 half is just v. Here uh, n is 2, so 2 times 3 uh, 2 times 3 is 6 over 2, 3 minus 2, so this is 2v. This is plus 3v, and so on. So the frequencies become non frequencies become different. This is the analog of the dependence of the classical oscillator frequency on energy. For the quantum oscillator, the transition frequency the spacing between the energy level depends on the energy on the level number. OK. So this is the quantum picture of a nonlinear oscillator. This is the classical picture of the nonlinear oscillator and the expected response of the nonlinear oscillator to the external drive. Now, the next question that I want to ask is, well, this was kind of a hand-waving argument, right? I want to do it seriously. And to do it seriously means that mm, I don't want to write an equation like that and claim that this is what happens. I want to start from scratch and describe the dynamics of the oscillator. To do it, uh, and we will do it both quantum mechanically and classically. We 
we make a transformation from the cord. So what we will be doing is the following. We say that our oscillator has high Q factor, that is, the decay rate is much less than omega naught. The detuning delta omega, which is omega f minus omega naught, is also small. And the nonlinearity is, is small. So what does it mean that the nonlinearity is small if I look on this equation? It means that this term is in some sense smaller than this term. That is, gamma q squared, this is the typical shift of the frequency of the oscillator due to the nonlinearity, is much less than omega naught. What I have in this case is the separation of time scales. I have vibrations of the oscillator, which are excited by the external field with frequency close to the oscillator eigenfrequency. And these vibrations are fast. And I have some slow change of the vibration amplitude and of the phase of the vibrations. This change is controlled by the decay rate, by the frequency detuning, and by the nonlinearity. And therefore, I want to look at these slow variables. They will control my fast vibrations. And incidentally, you see already from here why nonlinearity and when nonlinearity becomes strong when it is weak. So by all measures, this is the condition of weak nonlinearity, right? The nonlinear shift of the frequency is small compared to the frequency. Almost the frequency has changed a little bit. But I don't have to compare this with the eigenfrequency. I have to compare this with the frequency detuning and with the decay rate. And if they are all small, then my small nonlinearity leads to strong effects. And one of the strong effects is the bistability of the vibrations that I was talking about before. Uh, incidentally, if this condition is not met, if my nonlinearity is really strong, then the vibrations of the oscillator becomes very complicated. It displays, an oscillator displays what is called dynamical chaos. That is the trajectories of motion diverge, and the, and the oscillator dynamics becomes, uh, becomes very complicated. The attractors become uh, chaotic attractors, and it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very complicated dynamics. A lot of interesting things about dynamics far from thermal equilibrium can be learned without driving the oscillator very hard. They can be learned already in this regime, and this is what, what I'm going to tell you about. So how to describe it? This, again, what I will be talking about is the language in which nonlinear vibrations are described. So I have to change from my fast oscillating coordinate and fast oscillating momentum to something that does not oscillate uh, fast. And this something, this term has been used here already several times. It's called quadratures. And what I will do is I will write a canonical transformation. Q cosine phi plus P sine phi. And P is minus Q cos minus P sine phi plus P cos sine phi. So what is written is I have P and Q. And as I wrote it, I just rotated Q and P to some different frame. So this is angle phi, this is Q, and this is P. So this is a canonical transformation. It's just, it's just rotation. Uh, what I want to do is to make 
this phrase around. That is, this is the change to the rotating frame. So I had small q and p, I switched to large q, capital Qs and Ps, and this Qs and P, this, this frame rotates. Now what I will do is to make life uh, simpler, I would put here C and put here C omega F. Is this transformation still canonical? So what is the property of a canonical transformation? Quantum mechanical. Quantum mechanical is probably easier because classical canonical transformation are actually more fancy than quantum. And you probably have not seen them much. <laughs> uh, so what is, if I did not put this coefficient, what is the commutation relation between capital P and capital Q? Forget about these coefficients. What is the commutation relation between P and Q? Minus I H bar, right? Now, I rotated the system. What is the commutation relation in when I rotated the system? It's minus I H bar. The system doesn't care. Look, I look at, it at this angle, or I, or I tilted my, 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 my head. So it will be also minus i h bar. This is the condition that the transformation is canonical. My commutation relations don't change. Now, if I put here a constant c and c, c omega f, uh, will this commutation relation change? Of course it will. It's no longer a canonical transformation. So what I did, I made, I first was nice, I made a canonical transformation, and then I decided that I don't want to be nice. I, I changed, rescaled it, because it will be more convenient for me, because I will then switch to dimensionless variables. And of course, the commutation relation is no longer i h bar, but of course, what has changed is just that there is extra this coefficient. So my commutation relation is minus i lambda, and this lambda is h bar omega f c squared. I will put it somewhere here. Lambda is h bar omega f c squared. Just, just, uh, just this uh, this coefficient. Is it correct? No, it's not correct. <laughs> to make it correct, I have to put here h, divi h bar divided, right? Because I stretched it. So my uncertainty relation has to be squeezed back. So I have to put here divide by h by omega f squared. Now it is correct. It's like you measure volume in centimeters, or in, and then you change your unit to meters. The volume meter is 100 times uh, bigger than a centimeter. So in meters, it will be 10 to the, uh, for volume, 10 to the 6 smaller. So you divide, not multiply. Okay? OK, so this is, uh, this is uh, the canonical transformation that I am making. And with your permission, I will erase, oh, erase this part. I don't need this. Uh, <clears throat> right. I will need this. Now I want to derive, of course, equations of motion for my oscillator in this coordinate. And this is what we will be doing today. So again. I rewrite the Hamiltonian. We had the Hamiltonian in variable P and Q. And I now change variables 
to capital Q and P. And again, if this were a canonical transformation, I would have equation of motion, just Hamiltonian equation, I would have Q dot is uh, dH over dP, and P dot is minus dH over dQ. This is not a canonical transformation, so my H will be rescaled. And there will be a coefficient here. We will, we will figure this out. Now, in the presence of dissipation, I know that my in the presence of dissipation, my this equation has term minus 2 gamma p. Now, I will have here some dissipative correction from this term of dissipation. So I know the structure of the equation that I expect to obtain. And now I want to obtain that. So the way to do it is to, to, to do it. I will just make a short. It's good to do a long calculation before dinner. Then, then you are sufficiently angry at the dinner and you don't eat much, or vice versa. <clears throat> uh, so I have two equations. I, I have equation q dot is equal to p, and I have equation p dot is equal to minus 2 gamma p minus omega naught squared q minus gamma q cubed plus f cosine omega f t. And that's it. So let me try to see what follows from this equation. The interesting thing and an observation of, uh, for a long time, of reviewing papers. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen this transformation done wrongly. Uh, so be careful. You have two variables, q and p, small q and small p. You change to, to two variables, capital Q and capital P. You have two equations. You change to you change. You have two variables. You change to two variables. They are not independent. So let's do the first equation first. Uh, so I have to differentiate this expression to have this expression. So my q dot is equal. If I differentiate this, c q dot cosine phi plus p dot sine phi minus now I have to differentiate phi. So minus c omega f, the derivative of phi is omega f, q dot sine phi <coughs> minus p cosine phi. And this is equal to this line. This is this is how I define this transformation. So what I get instantly is that this expression is actually this expression. Therefore, this transformation means that <clears throat> cosine phi plus p dot sine phi is 0. These variables are related, as q and p were related. And therefore, when people are telling you that uh, you have to have this q is smooth, and this p is smooth, and these are fast oscillating terms shifted by phase, how can they be equal to 0? Well, 
we will see this is one of the pitfalls of the rotating wave approximation because the next thing that we will do is the rotating wave approximation and we have to do it with our eyes kept open so let me try to do the rotating wave approximation a long expression here and you will tell me if you can see it if you cannot see it uh, I will suffer maybe I will try this line here Let me rather be right this up. So I have to plug, uh, to differentiate this and plug it into, uh, into this equation, which is a long thing to do. But uh, what we will have is I differentiate p dot. I look at the left-hand side. Minus c omega f q dot sine phi plus minus p dot cosine phi. Uh, this was easy. Now I differentiate phi minus c omega f squared q cosine phi uh, plus p sine phi. And this was just this term, right? Well, it's not as bad as it looks, because now this is equal to minus 2 gamma p. I have the expression for phi, so it's, it is plus 2 gamma c omega f Q sine minus T cosine. At some point, I will stop writing phi because we know that all the sines and cosines are sine of the concepts of phi. Well, I can write I can write phi. Let's now look at this term. Minus omega naught squared C Q cosine phi plus P sine phi. And for now, let's just forget for, for a second about the nonlinearity. We come to the nonlinearity later. Plus F cosine phi plus gamma. Well, I can make, make life much easier looking at this expression if I notice that. First of all, I can divide by C omega f. So I divide by C omega f. I divide by C omega f. I have omega f here. But I do not even do it. omega f squared. So the first thing that I notice is that this term looks very much like this term. Don't they? What is the difference? Omega f squared and omega naught squared, right? But they are close to each other. So this is what this whole thing is about that I choose this, I consider the case where omega f is close to omega naught, and then these two big terms almost cancel each other. So if I move this term around here, what I will have, and keep in mind that omega f minus omega naught is delta omega, and omega f squared minus omega naught squared is 2 omega f delta omega, what I have is 2 c omega f delta omega times q cosine phi plus p sine phi. This makes life much easier. Because now I will try to divide by C omega F. 
Okay? So what I will have here minus q dot sine phi my, uh, plus p cosine phi is equal to, <clears throat> again, 2 gamma q sine phi minus p cosine phi plus uh, 2 delta omega q cosine phi plus p sine phi and plus f over c omega f cosine phi. Uh, can you read this line or it's already too low? Because I will be using it in a minute. God, that's hard. You, you were concerned that I will not use this whole box. <laughs> I'm almost there. <laughs> okay, so what I will do now, I will multiply this equation by sine phi. And this equation by cosine. And add them together. So this equation plus this equation. The fate of the first term is dramatic, right? It drops out. I have q cosine sine, and I have minus q dot sine cosine. The fate of this term is actually uh, much better, because I have p dot cosine squared phi plus p dot sine squared phi. So this sum becomes <clears throat> This sum becomes p dot. This is enough nice left hand side, right? Now is equal to, let's see what I have here. Let's start with 2 gamma. And I'm done with this equation, by the way. So I just deal with this equation as it stands. It's 2 gamma q sine phi cosine phi minus p cosine squared phi plus 2 delta omega q cosine squared phi plus p sine phi cosine phi plus f over c omega f cosine squared phi plus nonlinearity. Well, and at this point, at this point, I will do the rotating wave approximation. And here is something that people usually uh, put into their uh, back pocket. Uh, so is this term bigger than this term? Let's vote. Or you are too, 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 too tired to raise a hand. So I give you three choices. Bigger, smaller, or the same. So who is for bigger? Who is for smaller? OK, and who is for the same? Well, of course they are the same. <laughs> I'm, I'm clearly in the minority, but of course they are the same. There is no reason to say that this term, unless q is much less than p, 
but this turns out the same. Right? So what's the difference? The difference is, you don't agree? I think. Let's, uh, let's calculate them. Let's take phi equal to pi over 4. What is sine pi over 4? One, one over square root of 2 cosine. Right, so yeah, okay. they're clearly the same, right? <laughs> you will not get me on that one. <laughs> no, they are, they are the same. The difference is that Remember that phi is omega f t. And I want my p to be, I want to find in p a part which is not oscillating fast. And here is what you were saying. This term, sine phi cosine phi is one half sine two phi. It oscillates like crazy. Whereas cosine squared is one half plus one half cosine two pi. This oscillates like crazy, but this does not. Therefore, if I now say I want to keep in this right hand side those terms which are smooth, which don't oscillate like crazy, then I will drop this term. Then I will drop this term, and what I will have is p dot is equal to, this is 1 half minus gamma p plus delta omega q minus, I really don't want to erase this. Minus uh, f over 2c omega f plus gamma. Why can I drop these terms? So these terms are not small. But if I imagine that I'm looking at this equation and I see that p dot is changing on time scale 1 over gamma, or maybe 1 over delta omega, is changing slowly. And if I integrate this term over time, the time over which this change, this will change, is 1 over gamma, 1 over delta omega. It's a long time. These terms were fast oscillating. If I integrate them, they cancel out. So if I say that my Q is constant and my Q varies on this time, slow time, if I integrate this term, it's the integral of sine 2 omega ft. Integral of sine 2 omega ft is very small. So this is the idea of the rotating wave approximation. You say that you have terms which in P and Q, there are parts which smoothly vary in time and there are parts which oscillate. The oscillating parts are small. Their derivatives are not small. So imagine that I have P is P naught plus P1 sine 2 omega ft. I say that P1 is much less than P naught. But P dot is P naught dot plus 2 omega f p1 cosine omega ft, 2 omega ft. This term, even, even where p1 is small, when I multiply it by large number, 2 omega f, this term becomes large. So the idea of the rotating wave approximation is to separate terms which vary smoothly in time from Small terms, which are nevertheless fast oscillating, if you look at the derivatives, they are the same. If you look at the terms themselves, 
they're different. So this is what underlies the retaining wave approximation. And this is what we're doing here. And so I want to finish this equation So what I have is this equation for p dot. Now I could do the same thing for, uh, for the equation that I had before here. And I had an equation for p dot and q dot. And I could multiply them by sine and cosine instead of cosine and sine. And then the equation that I would have got would be q dot is equal to minus gamma q minus delta omega p and plus gamma blah, blah, blah. There will be no term proportional to f because I multiply this by sine phi. And sine phi times cosine phi is oscillating fast. So this is what I have. So. What happened here compared to what we had before? Is the following. I look at this expression, and I see that my this form this part has a Hamiltonian form with this h tilde equal to <clears throat> minus 1 half delta omega p squared plus q squared. Right? Then if I differentiate in q dot over p, I will have minus delta omega p. If I differentiate over in p dot over q, I will have plus delta omega q. So it's the Hamiltonian of a harmonic oscillator, right? With unit frequency, with frequency delta omega in the rotating frame. Now, I have also the term from the drive. And the term from the drive is only in p. So this would be plus f over to C omega F. And I don't know why it is plus, why it is minus. It must be plus. You didn't correct me. I will be making mistakes. Uh, Q minus. Wait a second. Minus. <clears throat> OK, this is without the nonlinearity. And now I have to add nonlinearity to these equations. Right? So how to do it? You remember I had this nonlinear restoring force, which was gamma q cube, which was gamma c cube q cube cosine cube phi plus 3p squared q sine squared phi cosine phi plus 3p q squared sine phi cosine squared phi plus p cube sine cube phi. And you remember what I was doing with this equation. I plugged in q and p, and I was multiplying them in turn by sine phi, cosine phi, and adding and subtracting. And so I have to do the same with this term. So what will happen? So for example, if I multiply this term by cosine phi and average out over the period, I will have cosine to the fourth phi. What is it if I average it over the period? I'm sure you remember the number. It is 3, 8. Mm 
with this term, I will have sine squared phi cosine squared phi. And this, you also remember, this is 1 8. Here, I will have sine phi cosine cube phi. What does it average to? Zero, right? Sine is odd, cosine is even. And this will also average down to zero. Therefore, in the equation for p dot, I will have, in my Hamiltonian plus, gamma with the parameter times what will sur survive uh, 2 omega f, uh, delta, no, 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 delta omega. Um, uh, uh, what will I have? A q cube. times 3, 8, times Q cube plus P squared Q. And I understand that I have to have a Hamiltonian, which tells me that what I will have in my Hamiltonian is, I wrote it in the wrong place, This is what I have here. I have here gamma c squared over omega f q times 3, 8. I'm, I'm done, plus p squared q. And therefore, in my Hamiltonian, I have to have a combination which will be symmetric, which will be q squared plus p squared squared. And how this combination works out, I understand that if I got it in p, and I know the structure of the equation like that, this is what I have to have. And therefore, I have the equations for q dot and p dot. I know that this dissipative term looks like minus gamma q and minus gamma p. And I have complete classical description of the system. Thank you. <laughs>